Tuesday, January 22nd, 2019, work session for the Board of Mayor and Aldermen. Uh, now's the time and an opportunity for citizens to make comments that are not on the agenda. I have no speaker's card, so I assume that nobody wants to speak tonight. So we'll move on to item one, which is actually the Tree Commission report, and we have decided we're going to need to con defer that until February the 12th, 2019 meeting. Again, yes, it's going to be a good report once we get it. Well worth the wait. Yeah, and <laughs> so uh, we'll go right on to item number two, which is Franklin Tamar on the table follow-up discussion. Right, so, thanks. Mindy. Thanks I'm Mindy Tate, I'm Executive Director for Franklin Tomorrow, and I've got with me the four co-chairs of our On the Table initiative that we launched in October of 2018. I've got with me Mary Lee Bennett, Alina Bell, who also serves as our board chair now in 2019, Jim Roberts, and Patrick Baggett. And we're going to go through our report quickly. Um, if you have any questions, we'll try to answer them. Uh, we would say up front that this is a treasure trove of information from the survey and we'll talk a little bit about that and these are preliminary results and we will continue particularly in the month of February to really dig a little deeper and, and look for some other items. We want to say thank you to the city for all your cooperation and all of the um, people who participated from the city staff as hosts and table leaders. It was amazing. And these are some pictures from various events across the city. And uh, as you can see, we had a thousand people participate, about a thousand people participate in the On the Table initiative. Over 400 people completed the survey, which is a really significant number. And those a thousand people participated at 50 public and private events. What we would say is that 42% of those completing the survey had lived in their homes less than five years. And when combined with the next category, 53% had lived in their homes 10 years or less. That was their current residence. That is the question we asked. We did not say how long have you lived in Franklin. We said how long have you lived in your current residence. Students from New Hope Academy, Franklin Special School District, Battleground Academy, and Boys and Girls Club participated in an on-the-table initiative experience, and that was great. And we believe the high count of zip codes, which is over 30 unique zip codes, reflects the draw of events like our Breakfast with the Mayors, which was the kickoff in October, as well as the transient nature of the workforce here in Franklin. What we learned, some of the things we learned, so you see that 84% reported they always vote in local elections. 84% of the people well, responding. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, we were, we were a little surprised. Um, well, some other great things, well, they're voters. 84% of the ones who participated in the survey. Right, of the 400, 84% of the, uh, yeah. of the 400. So if they're willing to participate in the survey, they're probably also willing to vote. I agree. Yeah. Exactly. So we also found that respondents are generous, with 87% saying they had donated money or other assets to charitable or religious organizations in 2018, and also that 75% said they had volunteered through or for an organization during 2018. And we'll see later in the report that a lot of them, when asked what they were interested in, talked about education. So many of them are probably going to be active in their children's schools or active in their church or a program there. So 66% believe they can have a moderate to big impact on making Franklin a better place to live. Additionally, 75% said they had attended a public meeting in which there was a discussion of public affairs. Okay, so I was pretty intrigued by that number. Well, that could be that they had attended a Franklin Tomorrow event, they had attended a city meeting, or some type of neighborhood meeting, but they felt they could have a moderate to big impact, and 75% they had attended a public meeting. From there, participants are ready for the next steps, and we're excited to talk tonight about the, that all age groups identify the t same top three next steps for action. They want to learn more about the issue or solution, get more involved in the community, and build relationships and collaborate. For us, that's exciting because, so we're, we were going to break this down into connect, learn, and engage. For us, that's exciting because those three words fit well with Franklin Tomorrow's mission, which is to engage the community, 
foster collaboration, and then advocate for a shared vision for the future of Franklin. We do this with popular engagement and education programs like Breakfast with the Mayors, which this morning had over 400 people in attendance again, as well as our monthly Frank Talks lecture series, which includes a quarterly City Hall on Wheels program. So we wanted to provide you in these next slides with some of the answers and open-ended questions, and so you can read those. We're not gonna uh, read those quotes, but they're really exciting to see that people were happy to participate in a conversation. 51% um, of the respondents said they were there to build relationships and collaborate. collaborate. So 48% of the people who responded though met people they did not know prior to on the table. So that is truly a great way and something that we can build bridges in our community. We plan to meet next month with those individuals who served as hosts during the on the table initiative and encourage them to keep the conversation going. We are also looking at programs which already exist, including one called The Great Reset, which started around a kitchen table in downtown Franklin last year and is now spread to 10 states and dozens of cities. And we'll be telling you a little bit more about that next, year, next month um, as we move forward with that. But that's Kalinda Fisher, who lives in downtown Franklin, and it's a program she started, and the Franklin Y is going to partner with us, or we're going to partner with the Franklin Y to make that happen in Franklin, across Franklin. So 71% left with a better understanding of how they can personally help address the challenges or opportunities facing the community. Some of the ways that we intend to help them learn is we are going to create a civic book and media <coughs> league, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. We'll also incorporate key topics into existing programming, such as Breakfast with the Mayors, or our monthly Frank Talks lecture, but also really hold programs that are very specifically geared towards the on the table initiative and the outcomes there. As we continue also to learn more about the out, what the outcomes really mean. It's, and so that's interesting. For Engage, 24% of the people who responded said they did not know how to get involved in the community. 45% are already involved in issues they care about. And those issues include education, historic preservation and community character, recreation and youth sports, and housing and affordability, and hunger relief and poverty. 39% said they are too busy to get involved. But we're hopeful that while they may be too busy to get involved, that doesn't mean that they, they did participate in this process. They did find the time to do that, so maybe they can engage through reading a book, if we identify one for a citywide read or a circle that they can participate in or one of our other programs. We are already working on plans with Hands on Nashville, United Way of Williamson County, and other nonprofits to provide a clearinghouse for people to find volunteer opportunities. And so where did they, the question was, where do you see three opportunities for improvement in Franklin today? I don't think any of these topics that are on the screen are going to surprise you, but they did come with new perspectives on old concerns. And those three opportunities where they saw areas for improvement were housing, <coughs> transportation, <coughs> and growth and development. <coughs> housing, people want to have the focus shift from 39, well, let me just say it this way, 38% expressed concern about housing in some way with attainable housing for all being the overall sentiment. More education is needed on what attainable means to those who identify this issue, but also to seems to reflect on options. Options across the board, <coughs> options for living in, in this community, but living not necessarily either in their current setting or allowing for more people to live in our community of different income levels and different age groups. <coughs> Transportation, 45% expressed concern about transportation in some way, and I will say only one person mentioned the Mac Hatcher extension, though. <laughs> um, but <laughs> that's good. Where's your shovel? Um, I can go get it. <laughs> um, people wanted to see land planning morph away from such a strong focus on the car that was established in the past. They want to see more connectivity and more unity and cohesiveness between residential neighborhoods downtown and Cool Springs and balance civic projects between roads, infrastructure, and civic parks and institutions. And growth and development. Put a bunch of quotes up here and um, 
a lot is about the small town charm. And I think it's interesting to think back to those numbers about how long people had lived in their current home. And as we said, that doesn't mean that was when they moved to Franklin, but the majority of the people who participated in this survey <coughs> had lived in their homes for less than 10 years, <coughs> in their current home for less than 10 years. But they feel the charm and they are not saying, 25% expressed concern about growth and development in some way, with a majority fo focusing on the pace of growth. With the fact that many had lived in their current homes for less than 10 years, they are looking for us to find a balance. People moved here for the quality of life and charm of Franklin, but also for the amenities, entertainment, employment, and scenic opportunities which exist. Very few talked about stopping growth completely, but want to see the charm maintained. And we can say that because many of these were open-ended questions. And so we spent a lot of time reading 400 answers. And we're gonna be going back to these, these respondents and saying, is this what you meant? Or did you mean this? Almost deeper surveying to find out the true impact of what they particularly want to see happen in our town. And we'll be looking to work with the city and other organizations to make sure we ask the right question that we ask it in the proper way and that we ask the right question. So what's next for us? Uh, as we mentioned, a civic book and media league with different circles focusing on topics such as leadership and civics, design and society, and history and culture quarterly, while also offering a citywide reading and discussion topic. Several years ago, Franklin Amaro was partnered with the city on the big read where we all read a book. And we'll be looking at working we have made a proposal to a book distribution company that's well known in the Middle Tennessee area to help us with this uh, opportunity where we can provide books through the library and other opportunities for people to read and we can have common discussion regarding those. As we mentioned, we're partnering with Hands On Nashville, United Way of Williamson County and its partner agencies and other local nonprofits to provide a clearinghouse for citizens to learn about volunteer opportunities. We're creating a widget on our website, which, say that three times quickly, uh, <laughs> that will allow you to search for uh, opportunities from Williamson County nonprofits that exist on Hands On Nashville. But this is a, a way that we can build trust and that people can move more quickly and we can help local nonprofits also get those volunteer opportunities up there quickly. And then specific programs to reconvene conversations begun through On the Table through other programs, as well as our commitment to a second On the Table event of some kind in fall 2019. We've visited uh, uh, communities and have talked with communities across the country that have conducted On the Table experiences in the past. And uh, their second year is always different than their first year. And we anticipate that as we continue to drill through the mountains of data and information that we currently have that will help us hone down and create a conversation for late fall of 2019. We would anticipate that would be in probably in November and we would anticipate holding that in a more focused manner perhaps um, come November. But we're here to answer any questions or offer any additional insights. Alderman Martin. When you talk about uh, adding more continuing these on the table meetings. Are you talking about with the same people or different people? Both. We would offer the opportunity. We, we want to meet with our host again in February to really go through this information and make sure maybe they have insights that we did not gain from them from their experiences in October. So we want to meet with them and offer their opportunities to gauge what their interest is in being part of continued conversation. But we've also been contacted by dozens of people who participated or weren't unable to participate and would like to be part of the ongoing conversation. Alderman Brown. Um, I have had the privilege, thank you, to be um, a part of this board for the last eight years. And I'll be honest, when we started talking about the possibility of this happening, I was like, I don't know if we can pull it off. And it was pulled off and it was done so immensely well. And you four people, as well as Mindy and Stacy, um, it, it was amazing to see the engagement, the different partnerships. Um, I myself attended three in one day, not to mention the mock one that we did at full service prior, but um, it, it, it was a really neat opportunity to be able to sit across um, 
the table with strangers and friends and compare notes on the common denominator, which, of course, is that we all call this home. So um, I look forward to seeing it grow and seeing other people participate and seeing how we can take this data and use it to help us figure out what we don't know. So good job. Thanks. Alderman Branch. Great job. <clears throat> um, I think it's so important you've already articulated that because we do these programs and we set them on a table mm -hmm. or we put them on a shelf and you all have an active plan to not do that. I think that's so important because as people participate in these kinds of things, they want to see what happened. And thank you all for following up on a plan to follow up on what has been done. And we do see areas for improvement. I mean, we would, our participation numbers uh, matched very closely the city census numbers as it relates to Caucasian and even in the African American numbers, but our numbers were very, were off as it related to the Hispanic population. So we want to make a strong commitment to try and involve that community um, in our community and in this conversation. And uh, we would also <coughs> like to see a wider spectrum of the business community present and to hold meetings in each of the city's four wards consciously make an effort to hold with work with you all to hold these meetings in each of the city's four wards yeah. other questions Good. great we'll keep great. moving thank on thank you thank you, thank you all Thanks, great resource for us um, <laughs> next i'd like to invite up mayor jill bergen <laughs> mayor brentwood who has assumed a new role in our community. Come a little closer down here. You seem kind of distant yeah. down there. <laughs> yeah, and I must uh, say what an honor it has been to, to work with Mayor Bergen uh, in many different aspects throughout our region. And uh, uh, we're honored that uh, she has agreed to take the job uh, for the Downtown uh, Franklin Association. And so, uh, Thank you very much, Mayor and Alderman. I appreciate this opportunity to say hello. I'm Jill Bergen. I am currently the uh, mayor in Brentwood. That is uh, my uh, day job. I also have another day job, though, now where I am recently hired, January 7th, as the uh, executive director of the Main Street Program for Downtown Franklin Association. And that is why I'm here before you tonight. Um, and it's a typically a routine item, I understand, but I did want to just take a moment and say hello to y'all officially. And I appreciate the chance to finish out my term as mayor up in Brentwood, and, uh, but I'm here in Franklin every day working hard because the first order of business for me is to complete this annual accreditation report, which happens to be due January 31st. <laughs> so I have definitely hit the ground running here, and it's been a great learning experience. But this item before y'all today is the um, letter of agreement saying that you do indeed want to be part of the Main Street program. Uh, and so the, if once you sign off on that, if you choose to do so, we will gladly uh, keep our heads down and keep following those uh, principles that they've established for us to keep historic downtown Franklin thriving. And, and the Main Street designation has been sort of a backbone of our downtown efforts over the years and a key part of the partnership that the city has with uh, the Heritage Foundation, the Downtown Franklin Association, and all the businesses that call downtown home now and in the future. And so it provides a lot of guidelines. It's a proven national program. And so it, it really gives um, some key support uh, in the work that we're doing and to, um, to our partners throughout downtown. So uh, we're glad to move it forward. It doesn't have any direct financial obligation to the city, but it is sort of a best practices <coughs> in terms of maintaining and, and working uh, in vital, uh, vital and revitalizing a downtown. And fortunately, we've had a lot of success in downtown Franklin, but we want to continue to keep working on it. And with Jill's leadership and the efforts of many uh, on our team, we're going to continue to do that and build a great downtown. Now, this should not be a new thing. I mean, we have done this in the past. Yeah, this yeah. has been so in so effect for a long time. Since 1984. Yes. So I definitely don't want to mess this nope. up, yes. No. <laughs> but this has been a common thread throughout it, and it's an important designation. Great. We look forward to working with you. Welcome to Franklin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank and we'll you. vote on this tonight. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item four is review of the development services report. 
Glenn is here. We do this kind of quarterly, but this is our year-end report, so reflect on what happened in the way of development in 2018 and really look at the five-year trend as, as well, or four-year trend. Yes, 2018 was another strong year, but I wanted to look back over the past four years um, to compare because we've had a long run now of very strong years. In 2018, the Building and Neighborhood Services Department issued an average of 30 permits a day or over 630 permits per month. A fun fact out of the next section for additional fees received, we received payment for 2,834 trash containers over this four-year time period. And then under the new dwelling units, 2018, we had 200 or 969 units approved compared to 1,595 units approved in 2017. The, mm -hmm. Yes, the largest decrease was, of course, in multifamily apartments with 405 units compared to 920 units in 2017. Is that multiple or is that single? There's a multifamily. I I'm sorry, what would you say? Is in the multifamily the, decre the significant the decrease. decrease? The decrease in multifamily? Yes. yes. Oh, there it is. Yeah. In 2018, the cool. average new single family detached home was 3,120 square feet of heated <coughs> space. That's 335 square feet, or 9.5% less than in 2011, which had the highest average over the past 10 years for heated square footage of 3,455 square feet. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you give those two numbers again? Because yes. I didn't see that in here. 2018, the average heated square footage of a single family detached home was 3,120 square feet. The largest square footage of a home in the past 10 years was in 2011 and that figure was 3,455 square feet. That was the largest built? Oh. Yes. That was the average. 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 The average okay, in a year. Okay, you said largest. I'm like, mm, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. I, Talking in averages here. Got it. 2016, 2017, and 2018 were by far the highest levels of investment in our community over the past 10 <clears> years. <throat> The next closest year was 2008, with construction valuation totaling over $592 million. In 2018, the city approved 19 new office buildings, which was five more than in 2017. Also in 2018, the city issued permits for four hotels and a total of 511 rooms. In 2017, the city issued five permits for hotels or 694 rooms. If you'd like to know more of the building activity that was approved last year in 2018, take a look at our interactive map, which is on the franklintn.gov website. If you go under the services drop-down menu on the home page and choose building development and building services, then in the left column, you can select development reports and maps, and then choose the direct link to the interactive map located about two thirds of the way down the page. On that map, we have the wards shown and also where the building permit activity was for 2018. And you can click on any of the dots and that will give you detailed information of what the building permit is at that location. Does anybody have any questions? Oh. Uh, I'm going. Okay. I'm not keeping up too fast with these little numbers, but then I'm trying to highlight it a bit so I could see it. And then I'm sorry. Could so um, I'm seeing utility constrictions here. I'm not seeing what the other thing I needed. You said in 2018 there were 19 new office buildings. Correct. And in, in 2017, what was that number? There were 14. 14. Yes. Okay. And um, got the hotels. And then you said something in 2008, uh, 592 
million dollars. That was the next highest level of investment in our community over the past 10 years. And what was it in 2018? 2018, it was $744 million. And then, so the second highest was 2008. No. Is what you're saying? No. The highest I'm was sorry. last, was 17. Right. In 2017 was $818 million. 818. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that. 2017. Got it. Thanks. Okay, other questions or comments? You don't happen to know the, uh, you, the, the I'm, I'm a little surprised at the 2011 number of 3,400 square feet versus the 2018 of 31. Mm -hmm. And well, I, okay, I understand average, but we keep seeing the average sale price of a new house being five hundred twenty something thousand dollars. So, is the what was the square footage average in twenty in two thousand eight? Do you know? In two thousand eight, I don't have that figure, but I could certainly get it for you. Okay, I mean, I'm just uh, you know, it's it's interesting that you that you are down. 300 square feet it's gone. average and, you cost mm -hmm. and your cost is considerably, it actually considerably goes up more. and down each year by one or 200 square feet okay it might be interesting to look too at the number of homes 2011 compared to what we saw in 18 yeah uh, you're kind of coming out of the recession in 11 so Correct. you may have had I, I'm educated guess you may have had fewer housing units compared to what Good we happen. saw in okay. 17, 18 time frame, and it may just be they were, they happened to be larger that year, but the, the sheer number may may have been less, I would guess they were, but don't know for sure. We could look at that in a little it's, more detail. It's a little bit skewed for 2011 because of the flood. Hmm. We had yep. a, an increase in permits in 2011 mm -hmm. as right. a result of oh, that, that as well. Okay. So it's kind of hard to separate those housing units out. Does the apartments go into that figure? No. Not okay. that one. That no. was just a single single family. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And the other thing that's pretty remarkable to look at is at the very end of the report, the four-year total of $2.8 billion of permitted investment mm -hmm. in this community in the last four years. Um, I don't think there's any four-year time frame no. in the city's history that's even close to that. So it's, it's a pretty remarkable uh, number to look at. Can I, can I just go back? You said, okay, go to services, and then what What do I go to? Oh, no, you go to the services drop-down, which mm -hmm. is right at the top of the I got homepage, it. and then choose development and building services. Thanks for getting rid of the buzzing. Good job, Madison. Is <laughs> <laughs> so, that okay? And then after yes. that? Apparently when Madison sits down. <laughs> choose on the left column, there's a left-hand mm -hmm. column, select building reports and maps. It's maybe the third one down. Uh -huh. Might be fun I next can, time you come, yeah. just actually do that. Yes, I'd be happy uh, to. Yeah, that'd be good I because- done that one yep, other time. Uh, <laughs> ago, but I can send out a link to everybody too in your update, I can sure. just do that. Okay, any other yes, questions or comments? If not, we're going to keep moving on. We'll go to a discussion. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Lynn. Thank, Thank, Thank you, you. Lynn. Yeah. Discussion of the Fuller Story Initiative. And uh, we have Kevin Riggs and Chris Williamson, two pastors. Pastor squared. <laughs> <laughs> time we come together I think it's uh, not all of us are here but if all of us were here I think it's a the beginning of a bad joke three pastors and a historian walking to the bar <laughs> it's a good no 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 it's worse than that three pastors a historian and nine politicians <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, tonight uh, we just want to kind of give an update of, uh, of where we are uh, in the process and um, uh, some things that have been going on and so this you know not a lot of information on this sheet but it's, uh, it's good for us to talk through. And I want to say, first of all, that I'm uh, very, very thankful for the support that we've received from you guys. And uh, even in the community, um, as more and more people find out, it, the support, I think, for this is just, uh, is just growing. And uh, we're, 
we're excited about that. A couple of changes from the original uh, proposal is an additional marker uh, that's part of our vision now that we would like to see. And then uh, we do have a, a location that we think is perfect uh, for the statue. And so the markers, and the markers are all but completed in the wording. Uh, Eric Jacobson has been working hard on that and has gone through vetting with, with numerous um, historians in the Battlefield Commission here locally, and, and uh, they're almost done. Um, but the markers then, in no particular order, I just, I just, I just uh, numbered them in the piece of paper, the marker about reconstruction and some things that, that uh, some positive things, <coughs> African-American businesses, even some businesses in downtown Franklin right after the Civil War that were opened by African-Americans and, and, uh, so, and uh, different African-Americans uh, elected to Congress, state Congress and all that during that time. So highlighting that, of course, the 1867 riot was just, just kind of um, not as big of a scale as in other cities, but just kind of showing the, the riot happened in downtown and it just kind of shows the continued difficulty even after the war was over, there were still just these lingering things. Uh, the courthouse and market house, of course, that's the slave market, and uh, that's uh, not a pleasant story, but I think it's a story that everyone agrees needs to be told, and we just need to be reminded of that fact. And then the, the additional one, and the reason for this is, is uh, we, we, we think, at least our vision, is that a place for the statue is in front of the courthouse in the square where there's already a marker, the, <coughs> the Civil War marker, right there. And we've already gotten permission to, to be able to move that marker and place the statue there and then the marker about the USCT soldier there. So that takes a, sta that takes a marker away. And the, the reason for the courthouse is, um, that is, is that during the Civil War, at the time the Union occupied downtown Franklin, uh, in that particular courthouse in the basement was a provost office. And um, African Americans could go into that provost office and get their paperwork started <coughs> to eventually go to Nashville, but in that provost office in the basement of that courthouse is where basically they would start their journey to become a USCT soldier. And so their journey from slave to soldier would start in that courthouse. And so out front, uh, uh, the statue of the USCT soldier in, in memory of that, plus the, plus the marker about the USCT just seems uh, to make sense and, uh, is an, and is an ideal location, at least in our, in our vision. And so that opened up instead of the USCT marker going in around the square, it left room for another marker. And, um, and so uh, we have decided that um, it, it would be a good idea then to have another marker that kind of tells the story of the Confederate monument uh, when it was put up. And um, there's a, uh, a long quote in that marker that Eric's put together of a Confederate general who spoke at the dedication of that marker. And so his words uh, are in there. And just, you know, because a lot of people don't know, they know the monument's there, but they don't really know um, when it was put up and, and that kind of thing. And so we thought, well, maybe that's a goodwill gesture, um, you know, that we want to recognize uh, our, our past history and what's already down there. This has never been about tearing something down. And so to, to be able to bring some type of recognition to the monument that's already there, it just seemed to make sense for us. Um, and so, you know, just by way of information or by way of change, as we think in our mind, we have a vision for where the statue uh, would be ideal. It, it meets that equal nobility, we think, uh, that uh, Mr. McClendon mentioned, um, because it's right there with, with everything else uh, that's there, and it's where a historical marker already is. And, uh, and then the addition uh, of the uh, marker that will say something about uh, the monument that's already there. Um, because of the, um, uh, the court situation, you know, obviously we don't know as far as the markers go when that could be. Um, we're, we're, uh, our plan is to work on the statue and the markers both at the same time. And, um, and when the markers are done, we can, you know, put those in a, a storage until things have decided. But in the meantime, we're working uh, on the statue as well. Um, we haven't started fundraising yet because we're still trying to work those details out. Our vision is to have, is to try to find somebody in the community who is a relative, a distant relative of an actual USCT soldier and uh, let that person be the model uh, for that. And so there will be a hometown connection, you know, even something that can be said, this person who modeled for this is actually, you know, their great, great grandfather was, uh, was a USCT soldier. We haven't decided on a, a sculpture yet 
Eric Jacobson has thrown an idea around and has, has uh, made an initial contact with someone who, who might be able to do it, but we, don't, we still don't have the firm um, prices of what that'll be. Uh, but even after yesterday at, at the MLK service, there were people who came up to me afterwards wanting to know, you know where can we give money uh, toward this. So we don't perceive that being a huge problem to raise the money. We think the community uh, support is behind it. Um, uh, from here, we're hoping uh, at uh, Mayor Anderson's invitation, last time we had a meeting with him to, to kind of take this same thing now to the county commissioners, uh, not for their approval necessarily, but he thinks it would be a good idea and thinks we can get it through where the county commissioners would also have a, a resolution passed just showing their support of this. And that would be huge if we had resolutions both from the city and the county that this is a, uh, this is a good plan and a good idea. So, so that's kind of where we are uh, right now. Alderman uh, Excellent update. Um, glad you found a location for the statue. Um, so I, I want to say a couple of things, one of which is not ex not directly on the marker issue, but on the, you mentioned the court issue. I want to make very clear to the public something that they may not know, which is that um, when the city, it was, I'll take blame or credit, whatever you want to assign, when the city decided to sue the United Dollars of the Confederacy, the nature of the suit was what's called a declaratory judgment action. What that means is that we've asked the court to decide who owns what. Not, not to take something or anything else, but to have, simply have a court resolve a controversy. Um, in the, within that lawsuit, the city of Franklin, in writing, has conveyed to the lawyers for the United Daughters of the Confederacy the offer to deed to the United Daughters of the Confederacy or their successor in interest, the statue, the land beneath it, and about a thousand square feet around it permanently. So anyone that is suggesting that all of this is about trying to take down the statue simply doesn't understand the facts. The fact is that we're trying to resolve it by offering to cooperate in getting them the deed that the county, com that the county court intended them to have in 1899. So just put to rest any of this nonsense about this is some elaborate conspiracy to take down the statue. That's just ridiculous nothingness um so all they have to do to own the statue with a deed is say yes now i will add that there are two conditions on that 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 frankly were um also you can blame me for this um uh, but when this conversation began uh there were people on a, who made the threat that uh that they would cover the square with confederate battle flags so the conditions on the deed that we intend to, that we've offered are that uh, the statue would not be removed and that nothing else would be added so that we wouldn't have additional controversy or we wouldn't have some after the fact added element to the thing. And also that the purpose of the deed would be permanently uh, accomplished, which is that, you know, whether we like it or not in 1899, the county court decided to give the Daughters of the Confederacy the dirt on which the statue stands. Now, what remains apparently is the UDCs, they'll have to decide whether they want to try to prove that they own the entire square or not. I, I don't think they do and I don't think they can, but that'll be up to them to decide. But if they want to own the statue, the dirt beneath it and about a thousand square feet around it, all they have to do is, is respond to our lawyer and say yes. And they'll have a deed approved by the court forthwith um, which leads me to the next point which is I've given it considerable thought and uh, as to these markers and just as I spoke about the equivalent dignity of the statue to be placed I also think that um, the statue on the square is um, is a monument to not a particular man but men, men who fought and put their lives on the line. And You're speaking of Chip right now? Yeah, Chip, okay. talking about Chip. Um, and so I, I think, my personal opinion on this is that the, stat, the square, <clears throat> I, I'm reluctant to put anything on the square that isn't directly connected to people who fought then and there. Uh, I am happy to have markers, all that you have suggested, 
around the square, but within the confines of the, the circle. Sometimes when people say the square, it's not clear exactly what they mean. But um, to the, when, I, when I say the square, I mean the part that you drive around. Um, I'm not hardened on this, but my inclination is to leave that a monument to the people who fought and died here. Um, that could include uh, USCT troops if the facts are that they did. I'm not so sure that I'd be interested in putting riots, reconstruction, uh, and other markers out in the square, um, simply because I do think that there's a there's an element of um, we can accomplish the mission without without necessarily doing that. Not necessarily hardened on that, but that's my inclination at the moment. I do welcome the telling of the fuller story. I I wish that we had been able to make your deadline of yesterday with the <laughs> with the markers. Um, I don't want to, I don't want you to put them in storage. They're 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 mobile. Um, when you get them ready and they're approved, let's find them a place to put them, even if it is potentially that we would relocate them at a later date. Um, if, but you know, I mean, certainly if there's a, a significant date upon which you want to put them out, that's fine too. Um, but whenever you're ready and whenever the markers have been vetted by all the appropriate historians, let us know, because I don't I don't want them to sit in storage while we resolve some lawsuit if that's the only reason. And w you, since you mentioned the markers again, one thing I forgot to say <clears throat> is the picture on the paper of the markers are what we envision. It, they're the Civil War trail markers that have been used throughout the city. We had some discussion on some of the other types of markers, um, but but think that these are uniform with what's already out there, and um, they're relatively easy to update and change, or if something gets vandalized to fix you know, without a major expense, uh, as compared to. Yeah, as compared to some of the bronze markers. And so those pictures are intentional just to show you what the, the markers will look like. Okay, uh, Alderman Berger. What about the marker in front of the courthouse? Where, where, where's that gonna go? There's a marker already there. Right, you talked about that's the courthouse and talked about. Yes. You know, the marker that's the, for the Civil War trails that's out more on the sidewalk. Yeah. Okay, talking about the, the courthouse court. marker is by the courthouse. We're talking about okay. outside the fence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's sort of a triangular right. mm -hmm. sort of shaped uh, landscaped area, and that's where the existing Civil War trail okay. marker okay. is. Okay. And so yeah, that's and what's. Yeah, and the marker looks like this, these, that's already there. Yeah, so it's right, outside. Yeah. It's outside the gate of the. So where is that getting moved to? Uh huh. The, um, it's either Carter House or Carton, one of those two. <laughs> Uh, is where I don't know. It's not staying out there. Yeah. And I'll speak uh, to. Who, I'm may sorry. I ask who, who owns the dirt upon which the statue that you intend to place would be placed? It's city sidewalk. Okay. Well, let's prepare a deed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hold on, branch. Okay. Do you, you have permission from the from the county to to work, or is it you don't need city? the county's okay. permission? Okay. Because I'm in court directly. House. Okay, as of today, we don't need mm -hmm. county permission to place the statue. Right, but we are going to seek just sure. a resolution from the county, just a goodwill. Right. right. Yeah. I think that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. Um, and once again, I had the same idea as who, who will own it. I mean, because we don't want to get 100 years down the road and all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. someone want to claim the dirt. Uh, right. so Learn from their mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and on the... Where exactly on the square will the one, two, three, four markers go? Yeah, we we took pictures and forgot to, to print them off, but if you can visualize the road okay. and then the sidewalk and then the steps yes. and then at the top of the steps and the grass. Okay. At, you know, w one at each of the four steps. Okay. What kind of time frame? I know there's a couple, couple things going. You got the bronze statue. Oh, say that again, I'm sorry. Where? You're talking about the, we're talking about the location of these markers. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. That's the question. Where exactly? One, two, Where? three, four. Well, you don't there, have the paperwork for that? In right, there, there's four staircases that go up mm -hmm. to the, oh, the big the grass. <coughs> area. You're talking about the oh, middle. The mm -hmm. Yeah. You're talking yes. about. Yes, yeah, so the, the road and then the, the, the circle or whatever it is, you have the road, then the sidewalk, and then the four steps, the four sets of steps, and so at the top of those steps in the grass. 
Okay, so if this that you're talking about gives them a thousand square feet around the UDC, around the statue, that would eliminate the the place for these markets. Well, no, it's roughly if you go out there, we there's a there's, a there's yeah. kind of a there's a, like a concrete um, area of yeah. pavers around. It's not it's it's not to the edge of the concrete. It's sort of interior to that. The language that the county court used in 1899 was something like, and I'm not going to be able to quote it directly, but something like, as much as necessary to erect the monument. And then there's pictures from this from yeah, two and three, absolutely. four years after that. Yeah. It makes it pretty clear that the current iteration of the square is far larger than what the UDC dedicated uh, in 1899. So I, and I think eventually the the to me the likely outcome of a controversy at the courthouse is that the UDC is going to own about, about a thousand square feet out there in the dead center, and the the rest of it around is going to be not theirs. Um, so th that's a long and way to say. If I could just it's clarify, because there's been some confusion, I think. When you say you weren't hardened on an issue, you were talking about not placing the markers in that central area of the square, but Regardless rather. Regardless of who owns it. Yes, but rather on the periphery Range. where the sidewalks are around. No, I'm talking, well, no, I'm talking about. If you could clarify, because I think everybody, to, you know, we talk about it's on the square. Yeah, well, that's, okay, to be clear, my view of the area around Chip is that and the cannons is that that that's not my preferred location for these markers for a couple of reasons one of which is i think there's a certain sanctity to the monument as it exists that should be respected even as we tell the fuller story another reason is because frankly you're going to get a lot more traffic to the to the signage if you don't have to go out into the middle of the traffic island to see it but th that's a far less re that's that's a far less important reason to me um, so, uh, I, but so I, I'll go back to Alderman Bransford then, if I could. We would like there, a schematic, schematic drawing of placement, maybe your preferred option and maybe a second option. I don't know. Um, could you all produce a schematic at some point in time? Absolutely. To, to the to the board. Yeah, we can assist okay. with that. Well, that's. Um, I've sat and listened to Alderman McClendon's comments and. He said, blame him for the lawsuit and blame him for something else. And then he says that it's his preference or his whatever to not have anything go in the circle up on the chip area. And Except I, for things that are directly related to the back. Uh, right, exactly. It's none of these. Number four. Uh, it, it would the courthouse the old courthouse was basically where chip is now and the uh, and the marketplace would be right beside that and so in that center circle would be where you slaves could have were three and four okay inside that circle would be where slaves were were bought and sold okay so I mean I mean I, I don't think I've I've not said too much but but my our private conversation has been if you remember said you can locate your markers tomorrow if they're not in that circle. You can have 100% participation from the board, probably 99.9% .9 participation from the public in an area where they would be more visible, more read, more uh, open to the public than it is because a lot of people don't go out across two and three lanes of cars to get to that center. They don't do it. I don't see a lot of people out there. Now, you may attract a lot of people with these, but I've, and you've got four quadrants out there now without the statue itself. And those areas are available. And I don't think there's anybody here, I'm certainly not, and I'm certainly not gonna say that I object to that. I think this is part of the history of Franklin. But I don't think that that's part of the uniqueness of the statue itself, okay? And uh, if, if and we're we're tied up in a lawsuit, it's possible. It's possible. 
we might not find a judge that says the city owns part of that. Because I'll, I'll give you my interpretation of the pile of dirt around there. When we did the streetscape in 1988, we built the dirt up around to protect the monument. Now, for whatever reason that was, and then at some point in time, probably in 2000 or whatever, the city agreed to take over the maintenance of the dirt around that simply because the UDC, the UDC was not able to do it. They didn't have enough people. They didn't have enough manpower. And we did that. But the dirt itself is not necessarily unique to anything other than it was a berm, in my opinion, to protect the monument itself from the oncoming traffic, and especially down 3rd Avenue South in that direction. Because if I remember correctly, somebody ran through and hit the statue with a car from 3rd Avenue South. And so the city decided we'll put, the, we'll put that up there. We'll maintain it. We'll, it'll in, it won't hurt it. It'll enhance it. But if you dug that dirt down underneath there, I'm sure that you'll find you probably could find some parking places down there because <laughs> we eliminated parking places to put that dirt there. And there's a great deal of circling and stuff that we've done on the square to do what we have done to make it like it is. Now, we can shop and look for a judge that says the city owns part of it, the UDC owns part of it, and we can give the UDC a, 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 a um, deed, deed for that. But, fellas, the UDC does not have the deep pockets that the city has to pursue the lawsuit. I don't think they do. And the UDC never presented the lawsuit to begin with. We started the lawsuit. We said, we'll decide who owns it. Well, uh, only after the gentleman said we were going to be in a lawsuit either way. Well, yeah. that, gentle, that, that, you, that you gentleman may have not, that <laughs> gentleman may have not been speaking totally for the UDC. He said he was. Okay, yeah. he said he, he was. absolutely <laughs> represented himself and, and, and as I, their and, attorney. And I, and I can say that I speak for whoever I want to say right here and now, and it might not necessarily be true, okay? Because I don't think he was. And that's my information for whatever that's worth. But I'm not going to get into an argument about that. If we decide to do that, I suspect the board will vote 8 and 0. I will. Wherever the board decides that's the proper place to put those markers, we will probably go 8 and 0 on that. But, I mean, you and I sit and discuss, you and Chris sit and discuss that once upon a time. It's been probably six months or so ago. And I basically I'm saying I think right now the same thing I said to you then. There's no issue on placing those monuments on the square. The issue comes in in the location in the center of the square. And if I might interject, the reason why we wanted the markers in close proximity to the statue was to protect it. Okay. And, that's and was to protect the city because for some the monument is a lightning rod of controversy. In other cities where monuments were torn down, um, I doubt if they would have been torn down if there was equal representation in close proximity to the statue because it spoke of ownership, collective ownership for the community. So that was the plan behind putting the statues around or the markers around the statue was to protect our city from an uprising, to protect that plot of ground from, an up, from someone coming in to vandalize it who may be upset about the, the southern, the typical southern perspective. It was a way to be inclusive for a new day to say that, and on this spot, slaves were bought and sold. On this spot, um, slaves marched through here. So that's why the close proximity was to quell future uprisings, which many people don't think can happen, but I'm sure the people in Charlottesville and Memphis didn't think it could happen either. So that was the purpose. And if you put them on the outside, which may end up being the plan, we, we may have no choice but to do that. And we're very flexible, we're very appreciative. But to understand our thinking, that there are people in this community who feel that if they are put on the outside, that looks like it's compromise and, 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 and one side lost, if you will. But if it's put in the center, uh, it speaks to the fact then that one we are lost. in this together. Yeah, but a side that's been winning since 1899. That may be true, but, I, mm. but with all due respect, sir, I, I don't think the people who would tear down public monuments will be mollified by a sign anywhere. Yeah. 
They're just going to th that. So I, that we disagree about that, and that's fine. And that's fine. But but uh, th this is well. When I said a thousand square feet, I don't know if it's a thousand square feet. It's a it's, it's maybe the paved about, area that it's you the paved see area there out there in the middle. The it's <laughs> maybe ten yards on a side. Whatever that works out to be, it's it's certainly substantially less than the entire interior yep. that you drive around. It's it's just the core of that. It's got Alderman Martin and Alderman Plant. We've talked about this before a lot, but. If you have four markers that tell a story, we've got people, who, good sidewalks all around the, all around this square, S sidewalks. Not the, forget the center. Have one in each quadrant <coughs> that people could <coughs> walk around and have a bench there. Let them sit, let them read, let them absorb the story. And they wouldn't have to go in the street. They could go to each to each marker. I just feel, Kevin, that that you all can diffuse any hard feelings. We've gone years without a riot on the square. Years. We never, we never, it never occurred to anybody that there would be a riot. We've had riots, but it wasn't because of the marker. It was because somebody came through town and shot a bunch of people. And, and I was involved in that. And I, so I know I about that. I wouldn't think that would be like you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, which part, which part would you clarify which part you shooting? <laughs> you, you on camera. <laughs> <laughs> but it was. Um, <laughs> anyway. I live next door to you, Alderman Martin. I'm a little afraid already. But it wasn't because of the square. It was not because of the statue. It was because young people got angry about some other things. I just think that you all have such an organization that started, and you've got such peace in your hearts, and you are spreading that to this community. And I just, I want what's best too. But we've got these four quadrants with grass. And to put a couple of benches and a marker to let people come and enjoy and absorb this full story. Forget the middle of the square. I mean, just, you're trying to make a point, as you say, to protect the city. I just think you can do that by appealing to people's hearts. Well, if I can interject, and, sure. and please, I, I don't mean to, um, um, we're trying to listen, and I don't mean to sound offensive by any means from this, but I'm a little confused uh, because I get the impression, at least from some of the aldermen, that this is the first you've ever heard of it, that of where we wanted them to go. In reality, there would be no need for a declaratory judgment exactly if it wasn't clear from the beginning that this is where we preferred and we have not got any in private conversations I, you know mr. Barnhill did tell us tell us what you know what he thought uh, but then it moved forward you mean to put it in the middle yeah I, I think that was clear for everybody because that's well, we why the declaratory well the decl we no the declaratory because the where you're talking about the declaratory judgment would not have been necessary no it would have yeah. regardless if you had decided to abandon your project altogether we had to resolve this property issue because it's come up for 20 30 years with them but not outside of that circle yeah. now, I know yes, the lawyer said has. that he oh. thinks he owns it the has. whole downtown I mean, it, area it, it, it has it, it has. We we had a we had a lawsuit in. Well, then back court. to Mr. Barnhill. Then we couldn't do any. We we would still be in a holding pattern. Even if we put them on the peripheral, we're still going to be in a holding pattern until this is declared. Then, which is not. Well, no. My, speaking only for myself, my what I think is appropriate for out in the middle, whether it's wherever that is, are things that are directly directly related to the military history that that existing monument represents it's not it's not a t I, this this may sound like a dodge it's not to me that is a military oriented monument it was not placed during it was not it was not like and i draw a distinction between 
a, a, a monument of a general that was placed in 1957 in a city that general never fought in. That's clearly a Jim Crow thing. That's clearly a, 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 an inappropriate historical reference. That monument was placed by the widows, orphans, daughters, mm -hmm. uh, and, and mothers of men who fought and died here. Now, I'm not, I'm not justifying the, the side and the idea for which they fought, but it is a military-oriented monument. It is a generic Confederate soldier, not a particular general or soldier. That, to me, is why the only thing that should go in close proximity to it are things that are likewise about that battle that that monument was right. erected on an anniversary of to celebrate the people, the men who died in that battle. So I'm, I'm perfectly willing to go to the mat and, and, and win this, uh, this declaratory judgment action and then have a discussion with you about which of these qualify under the criteria that I'm articulating. But some of them I don't think could. For example, Reconstruction. Clearly an important element of the story of Franklin and definitely deserves to be told with a significant place in the middle of our town. But it, had, but it is, by definition, it is not something that directly relates to the Battle of Franklin. It's a much larger, you know, it, they're, they're, so. Well, then again, I, and again, I, please. But um, I don't disagree. Have, with you. Right. So well, with, I, I understand why you're saying that you, you're somewhat taken aback. <clears throat> but the reason that I brought this up now is because we are that much further along. Well, the, the, the middle section then, I mean, w would that be the place for the USCT statue? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking now with that statement. Yeah. Well, Should that be in the middle? That I, yeah. I, well, it, my issue with that then becomes the visual image of Chip yeah. and a more, you know, life-size version, yeah, I, you know, but I, I'm, I'm willing to listen to the advocates okay. of, the, of the project, but... When I, mean, I that said gives equal us nobility, a, that gives me something to think about. If if it's military and the USCT statute, that's my that's one man's view of it. Right. And I come from I didn't serve, but I come from a family of men who did, and and it has been veterans in particular that impressed upon me the sanctity of a, of something that honored men who fought and died in a battle. That that's well, that's the line I'm drawing. Not not a social <laughs> justice line. Not a, I'm making, I'm, I'm attempting to compromise with the people who would claim that we're trying to tear it down. Okay, that, that's not where I'm coming from. So I, unlike perhaps some of the other aldermen, I, I don't have, I don't have a, a thou shalt not place anything in the middle position. My position is that, though, that there, anything placed in the middle should be directly related to the events of the battle and the men who fought in that battle. If it turns out that there were USCT troops that fought in the battle and that are that need to be part of that story, let me know. I, I'll be the first one to confess. I'm not. A, I'm not. I haven't spent years versed in, you know, the details of the Battle of Franklin, but that that's where I'm coming from. So some of these markers, you know, Reconstruction and and 1867 riot, um, you know, but clearly I think the the erection of the Confederate monument to the extent that it is told in a way that is not, you know, unnecessarily, I, I'm all for fact, okay? I'm not for, I'm not for revisionist history by anyone. And I'm not for divisiveness and I'm not for attempting to, to, you know, like even the score. It can't be evened. It can't be evened. So. But I do, I do feel like that the goalposts have been moved on us. If I'm not mistaken, um, the lawyer for the UDC, he said um, what you're mentioning now about putting the markers on the outskirts of the square. Like, he had no problem with that. And I think one of the reasons he objected to the vision was because it did speak of closer proximity of these markers. I'm if sure I'm not that's mistaken. part of it. So, so, and as Kevin has mentioned, I thought we had support from all of you for the location of the markers. Well, and keep so in now mind we're moving back to we, what we've only seen was. a we've only seen a draft of the of the yeah. verbiage yeah. to be put on the markers in the first place. Yeah. So I don't I don't think I respect that you feel like maybe we've moved the goalpost. On the other hand, none of us have been presented with the final language that you would have us endorse. So 
but your language wasn't uh, in accordance with his language that day. I'm not, listen, I'm not conceding an inch to that man. No. Never. No, but that man mentioned what he, he did, but just. So because no. he just, mentioned it, we also just mentioned because, it does not yeah. make it one and the same. Just because, just because he him, has, just, just because some of the markers fall into the categories that I'm articulating, he has a, that's where you need to ask someone's motive. Okay. <laughs> I'm about celebrating facts and preserving a, yeah. the sanctity of what I consider to be a military monument, which I'm not naive. I understand the, the, the context too. But it was not a marker placed, hmm. you know, 50 or 60 years after it, after the turn of the century, uh, to celebrate a particular person that had little or no contact to the city of Franklin. If I go ahead and recognize Alderman Blanton, she wanted to have a comment. Oh, it's fine. Um, I guess I want to reiterate, if we can and find a common ground. Let's go back to the beginning that we do support the fuller story. We do, I do, let me, I'll speak for myself, that I do want to see both sides of history be spotlighted. I do think it's important that, that for friends and, and generations of people who felt like their story wasn't even taught, recognized, or spoken, I think it's important. Um, I think what I'm recognizing is that it, the placement might be and, and I'm with you, Chris. I agree. You, you brought us some really good points when that attorney said, I'm fine with them being on the outside. We just don't want them on the inside. There wasn't a, there wasn't a, now wait a minute, at that point. Well, except for the fact that I called an executive session and decided to have a no, lawsuit. No, I agree. But I think, too, um, and I'm just putting this out there. Um, I think that some of these are extremely relevant to be placed in the center. Um, maybe not all. And I'm not trying to backtrack, but as you start reiterating and, and, and fine-tuning, um, I, I do think maybe there's a, a way to split the difference or balance it so that everybody is getting met. Um, I think the bronze statue being downtown instead of some of the areas that we talked about previously is awesome. You're not getting pushback from that. So I understand you feel like the winds are out of your sails, but I think we do need the schematic. I think that will be really helpful for everybody to put a visual on it to see how, I mean, I know what these look like out at the um, Eastern flank, these specific type of markers. I think let's get a schematic so people can really make an informed decision. Bring the verbiage back so everybody can see what exactly it says. Um, I, I, I totally understand your passion and I do support this. Um, I just think we have to answer to our constituents too. And that may be where some of this is coming, that since the initial um, sharing of this idea and we're all incensed and, and passionate and I am still as well, we also have to answer to the people and try to make everybody happy. Um, so I think get the schematic and let's keep talking about what we can make a reality. but. Um, this is a very, very, very important initiative that we need to figure out a way to make happen. I have Alderman Branchford, then I, Alderman Berger. I just want to say uh, a couple of closing statements, but because we are trying to tell the fuller story, we're not trying to tell the partial story in this in this space. So I agree, there are several of these markers will be fitting to be in that space. <coughs> um, the com marker number four, as we have here, the Confederate Monument marker, mm -hmm. uh, which talks about Chip and those brave men who fought and died for their cause. The courthouse and the market house. I'm sorry, if you think the Confederacy War, I mean the um, Civil War was not about slavery, then you need to do a little research if slavery was not a component of that war. So the market house, the courthouse market number three could tell that story. I don't know what the verbiage is on that, um, Eric, but uh, whatever that is, but if it's pertaining to the slave trade that was going on during the Civil War, which we are talking about here, that would be appropriate. Yes, Reconstruction could possibly be elsewhere. I'm not gonna dial that heel, uh, the ride 
could possibly, but if we're talking about military, as it's been articulated on this board, is then the USCT statue, the little small bronze statue, could very well be on that square as well. So those are. The vision is life size, correct? Yeah. Life size, no more. It'll be yeah. on a pedestal, so seven, eight foot range total um, of that, so that you can. You can look them in the eye. And I, my understanding is that the riot did take place at the square, you know, in that middle section. And with yeah. the, never going to be there when you tell the whole story yeah. of everything that happened on the square. <clears throat> yeah. I need to recognize Alvin Berger. Yeah, I'm going to be real quick. Um, I, 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 I agree with a lot of things Dan has said, and, and Brandy as well, and um, and Clyde. <laughs> and there's just a lot of good things that have been said here tonight, and I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, but, you know, First of all, whatever that attorney said, his reasons for whatever he said about the square is certainly are not my reasons. I, I don't want to speak for anybody else up here, but I, I, you know, just because he said something that we said doesn't make that you know, united for the reasoning behind it at all. But I, I, I've heard from a lot of my constituents. I've talked to them about this at length. Um, there are a couple things that, you know, the square is pristine. It's very, it's, it's a very nice area to look at. It's got a lot of landscaping. It has the cannons, it has the carriages. We put our Christmas tree up there. And we, we start adding things to that middle section of the square. Where does that end? Who else comes and asks us next to add more and more things to the square? So I'm a little protective of that center section of the square because it, it, it is, it, it's really beautiful to look at when you drive in there, and and I don't want it to become overburdened with uh, additional items and things. But I do totally support what you all are doing here. I, I do, a hundred percent, a thousand percent. But the other thing is, it's very difficult to get to the square. And I know that we have, how many thousands of visitors we have here a year? I don't even know anymore. 1.6 million. 1.6 million, a lot. And people are on our sidewalks all the time. They're in front of that old historic courthouse. They're around our square. And they're constantly walking with their children and people. And I think to have, what, what, what do we want out of this? We want people to read these things. We want them to know the fuller story. So let's help them do that because I think we put them in a place that really has the opportunity for people to go and be there. And, and if you go to the square, in the center section of that square in the summertime, you don't want to stay there and read. You don't want to stay there and read anything because it's so hot. And I notice people go up there to get their picture taken and they stand by one of the cannons to get their picture and they leave. But, you know, we have shade trees all around the outer part of the square. So I think we need to be thinking about those things because I think there's more to it than, you know, this conversation tonight. I think there's a lot of things that we should think about because we want people to read these things. So let's make sure we give them the opportunity to do so. And, um, and let's not read into verbiage that if I, another attorney comes up here or somebody else says something not read into what people are saying or thinking or what do they mean by that let's be done with that let's know that this board has been so supportive of this and we have an opportunity to to add these and I totally agree with Dana it, this is a, a military existing military monument and I do think that we need to keep that uh, in that order I think we need to, to make sure that is protected for that reason um, and, and there's so many other things I could say, but um, I, I just think that we need to be very careful that we don't misinterpret people's words because I know these people up here, you know them. Uh, we know the people in our community, and if nothing else, we know their hearts, and they're good. I. I don't find that we have the issues that a lot of other places have because if we did, we wouldn't have this conversation right now. And so I do respect the part that you're saying that 
we also want to protect and we also want to work with the people to protect what we do have in our city and so I really appreciate that okay we're gonna wind this discussion up and uh, mr. Stuckey wanted to say a couple of comments we'll bring it back but we have still have a lot of items on the uh -huh. agenda so mr. <coughs> I, I do want to comment on a couple things um, and I'm glad to work with this team and bring you back some more specifics that language has been nearly form nearly finalized for at least the four originally proposed markers um, I do want to comment though you clearly own that square I know we're going through this declaratory judgment thing but you build it you've maintained it for decades it's yours mm -hmm. and when you did when you redid streetscape you you enhance that area and you and you alone paid for it everybody else involved in streetscape paid that were property owners in that case only the city paid you own it okay so don't don't think otherwise we're gonna go through the, this process but your actions and everything we've done for decades shows ownership shows community ownership we never have heard complaints about putting items there for the various festivals when we put the Christmas tree there we've never heard a complaint when we put the gun carriages there not a single word but not till we bring up until these markers are brought up is there this challenge yep. so I think that tells you a lot of what you need to know about the nature of that challenge and I want us to stand strong yeah. on what is ours mm -hmm. the second point I just want to make to you is historical context does matter and I think that ought to be what drives this I want to try to give you that when we come back to you the fact that that original county courthouse was located where it was mm -hmm. ought to mean something we have hundreds and hundreds of acres that we have now reclaimed as a community for the military aspects of that battle let's not forget that uh, and to be able to tell more of the story where it actually happened should be a, a pretty important factor in what we do whether it's military or not and especially if it's on that square in that location um, Freedmen's Bureau was located on the on the square in some location I'd like to, to hone in on that that might make sense to recognize where the Freedmen's Bureau was and tie that to reconstruction that might be a logical thing but let's be driven by what is truly tied to the history and what happened at that location when I go to a historic site it means something to me to say well that really happened here not just somewhere around here it happened here so if we can do that with some uh, clear definition I think we ought to try to do that that's my personal opinion and I would urge us to try to do that and that's what I will work with these gentlemen to bring back to you and uh, give you some 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 more direct concepts to work from um, but but let's keep moving forward okay we're gonna move on to the next item thank you uh, which is uh, discussion of the sanitation and environmental services cost of service study and operation refinements all right so one of the things we've been working on for a couple years now really and, and since Jack came into this position about a year and a half ago is really doing a full assessment of the nature of our uh, sanitation environmental services um, that whole structure and that came out in the budget process a year or two ago and so that has been a charge that we've given uh, Mark Hilty as our public works leader and and Mark as our leader or, or uh, Jack as our leader of sanitation and looking at that and so we want to present some data for you that better breaks down that cost of service and some specific considerations around the nature of the services we provide and, and what is kind of our core services versus some of the other elements that we we provide so thank you very much so um, as Eric had mentioned uh, Jack and I and members of his team have been stepping through uh, cost of service study and also evaluating a number of their different day-to-day -day operations um, like to talk to you tonight about um, a cost of service looking at FY 2018 as the baseline and looking at the actual expenditures during that period uh, we also um, looked at uh, two other scenarios one was to include uh, the the costs that would be associated with a sustainable fleet so what what I mean by sustainable fleet is, is that we have any number of pieces of equipment and vehicles that that operate out of sanitation and environmental services um, sustainable means that we fund the cost of replacing those vehicles based on 
the uh, anticipated replacement costs and the anticipated life cycle, life cycle of that piece of equipment. And then we also uh, looked at modifying some of the operations within SES uh, and wanted to report back out uh, as well. In addition, we wanted to talk about curbside recycling. Uh, we, we've broached this subject previously, but um, wanted to talk about that a little bit more in depth and also our commercial, commercial collection uh, operation as well. So uh, just to give you a little brief background, sanitation is broken up into three major divisions. We have administration, uh, we have the collection division, which uh, performs services for residential and commercial um, uh, properties, as well as the transfer station, which is in the budget referred to as the disposal division. And they operate the transfer station and, and run trucks to the landfill and a number of other different operations. So no, when you look at, I had to look up what, yes, um, Jim, whatever S W what municipal, oh, solid, municipal waste. solid waste. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, <laughs> my apologies. Yes, M S W is municipal solid waste. Um, so when you do a, a, a cost of service study, uh, one one of the key elements to that is allocating the expenses of your operations into, um, I guess, different categories. And in this case, we used. The, the services um, defined in, in our residential program. We have municipal solid waste, uh, bulky items and white goods, yard waste, and curbside recycling. And in commercial service, um, that was evaluated as, as one, uh, one business unit as well. Um, so the way that we allocated administration costs, such as Jack here, uh, is did that based on a, a ratio of employees per division. So We'll get to that here in just a little bit. So also within the collections <coughs> division, we allocated the expenses uh, per service based on the, the ratio of employees with that, that served that purpose. So if you're a municipal solid waste uh, operator, then you know, so that's how that, those were all allocated. So for bulky items and white goods, um, there's, not a, there's not a specific unit uh, that, that goes out and does that on a daily basis. That's, that's done. It, it's not a regular um, operation that's performed throughout the day. So we estimated the allocation for those, <coughs> for those items at about uh, at 10%, uh, which seemed to be pretty reasonable based on, on tonnage and things of that nature. One of the other items that we needed to do was allocate the cost of the transfer station, and that was done based on tonnage. So the way that they operate is they, they handle you know, 90 some thousand tons of material per year. And we looked at the ratio of municipal solid waste tonnage to recycling tonnage to uh, yard waste, et cetera, and allocated those expenses based on, on that, those factors. Um, in addition to that, the landfill expenses were also allocated based on tonnage, which makes sense. We, we pay a, a gate rate of about $35 a ton. Um, and then fleet expenses for the FY 2018 base study, we looked at the actual purchase of vehicles during that year. And when we get into the sustainable fleet discussion, we'll, we'll dig into that a little more deeply. So the initial allocation of personnel, <coughs> and that was you know, again, allocating the administration staff uh, and expenses to collection and transfer division, about 84% uh, of administration expenses went to the collection division, uh, and about 16% went to transfer station. So here's the, the breakdown for that, with a total expenditure for the year of about $8.2 million. Um, in FY 2018, we purchased one piece of equipment, um, and that was for uh, servicing re residential municipal solid waste. Uh, so that's how those costs were allocated. And then in terms of um, the transfer station and landfill costs, those costs were allocated, as you see here, based on the percent distribution on the, on the bottom row in this table here. I know I'm running through this really quickly, so please stop me. <laughs> Touche. So <laughs> when you... <laughs> Thank you. When you pull all that together, um, this table represents the allocation of expenses to um, all the different residential services we provide, the commercial service that we provide, and what the costs are associated with the transfer station. Again, about $8.2 million total. 
Um, so the production summary in terms of customers, we have about 20,000 customers that we, residential customers that we serve on a uh, monthly basis. Bulky items and white goods, it's, again, it's a very sporadic, um, a very sporadic service that we provide and it's usually either a phone call or uh, one of our staff <coughs> observe uh, bulky items or white goods out on their route and call it in. Um, yard waste, residential recycling, and I'd like to draw your attention to the, the commercial side of it. So it, in order to, to make an appropriate comparison, because we have on the commercial side, again, roll out customers as well as dumpster customers. And they can either have a pickup between one time a week up to five times a week. So what we've done is defined really a monthly customer equivalent to put it all on the same kind of scale. So we have about 800, well, we have 873 customer equivalents. Actual customers is about 650, somewhere in that neighborhood. So that gives you an idea that we have a handful of customers that get multiple pickups per week. So these data are derived from our revenue management records uh, mm -hmm. that, that are kept by Mr. Sullivan uh, down the hallway. So again, pulling it all together, we looked at a handful of different scenarios, FY 2018, sustainable fleet, and then modified operations, operations with sustainable fleet. So when we get into the modified operations, this is just a summary of what those modified operations are. So right now, the, 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 excuse me, the department uses uh, split rear loaders for the pickup of ground trash and yard bags. Um, and really what we're doing is sending out a, a piece of equipment and a crew um, that that operation can be handled with other pieces of equipment that are already out there, such as um, you know, people who are picking up municipal solid waste as well as knuckle booms. So that's what we're, we've, we're, we've evaluated in moving forward. One of the things that has not been done terribly well over the years is enforce the buck bag program. Um, in this case, a lot of the reasons why it's not been enforced is we have a lot of temporary staff that go out they either don't know or hadn't been, you know, trained, to, you know, they'll show up in the morning and then they go out on route and they're out there to pick up trash. So they grab the bag and throw it in the truck. Um, so that there's been a, a push to enforce the bucket bag program uh, more readily. One of the other items in the modified operations is move towards automated curbside recycling. I think we've had this conversation before. Currently it's a blue bag program. It's been very successful, sorry, over the years. Um, we get a, a great deal of participation. Unfortunately, the bags themselves are a contaminated, contaminant to recycling. Um, we all, we'll, we'll dig into that here in a little while. Um, and then also, as we discussed last time, which we should have skipped to the last slide, was the use of an air curtain burner for uh, wood waste management. So um, anyway, we could talk about that conversation again if you wish, but I think we killed that one pretty well last time. So. <laughs> So here are the results for the cost of service analysis for the FY 2018 baseline scenario. Currently, the, the residential rate is $19.50 per month. Um, as you see on the far right column, um, cost of service is $18.95 for FY 2018 operation. Um, commercial, uh, the cost would be, and this is an average between dumpster service and rollout roll out container service is $85 a month. And then our cost at the transfer station is $47.84 per ton. And we're, so good news is in FY 2018, our, our residential rates currently cover that cost of service. And we'll get into that here in just a moment. Um, commercial costs, we are um, under, well, we're, we're actually doing well in that as well based on FY 2018 actuals and transfer station also doing well. So the issue comes when you in introduce a, a sustainable fleet. They have dozens of pieces of equipment and vehicles out there that they need to keep on the road. Um, what we had done in, in terms of identifying the costs, an annual cost to have a sustainable fleet, again, is add up the total anticipated replacement value of those pieces of equipment based on their anticipated life cycle. 
And what that equates to really is an expenditure of 1.37 roughly million dollars a year in order to maintain the fleet based on um, that anticipated life cycle. And you can see how that's distributed between all the different residential divisions, or excuse me, res residential services, commercial services, and transfer station. So when you look at um, the cost of service when you introduce a sustainable rate, that rate goes, the residential rate goes up to $22.45 per month. The commercial rate goes from 85 to a little over $100 per month. And the transfer station costs go to a little over $50, a little shy of $51 per month. Again, on the transfer station, we're still in, in good shape. I think we charge $55 per ton currently. Residential side, we're, we're close. So again, we're at 1950. And commercial, um, we're starting to, you know, we're, we're not recovering what we need to recover at this point. So in, in going through the modified operations, which I summarized earlier, um, this would provide for this table of proposed fleet changes. So we would move from uh, four rear loaders to three side loaders, um, go from four split rear, rear end loaders to two knuckle booms, eliminate a recycling, uh, or excuse me, a, a mini pack, which is one of those smaller rear end loaders, eliminate a road tractor, um, eliminate the grinder and replace it with the air curtain burners we discussed last time, and then eliminate a walking floor trailer. So the reason we can eliminate the, the, the tractor and the trailer is because we're, we're reducing our requirement to haul long distances, large amounts of material. On the personnel, excuse me, I jumped the gun. So going back to a sustainable fleet, sorry, I'm not sure how that went. Um, if you remember the, the previous table, it was about $1.37 million. Um, making those changes, we can reduce that annual expenditure for a sustainable fleet to about $1.24 million. So there's a little bit of, of annual savings there in terms of fleet. Um, and on the personnel side, and I, I want to be really careful here, the, the top row says eliminate four positions. Um, this again is looking back at FY 2018, and as we heard from Lynn earlier, you know we're we're growing. Um, we have no expectation or desire to eliminate staffing or positions. Where does it say that, Mark? You've lost. I'm sorry. If you look, watching. the top row staffing <laughs> eliminate four <coughs> positions. It's on page. It's in quotes. Slide 16 or 22. 16 and 22. If you're looking looking at the bottom got it okay good so the idea we, we wanted to do a, a comparison based on um, expenditures that happened in 2018 so again eliminating those positions we're not proposing that happens um, what we're looking at though is as we move forward we're going to be requesting of you to hire additional staffing so this elimination would actually offset the requests to hire additional staff. It would be that. reassigning positions, essentially, yes. not eliminating, but using yep. them elsewhere in our operation in our core residential services. Correct. Um, one thing that we can do, though, however, is eliminate um, a lot of, I'm sorry, I'm not sure why that's going, uh, eliminate a number of temporary positions. Um, and one thing we like to do, though, is budget for uh, an allowance for temporary positions should we need them. Um, so looking at the modified operations and sustainable fleet scenario, we have a residential cost of, of $20.75 a month, reduced it by a little bit based on the, the previous scenario. Commercial costs are about the same, and the transfer station costs are right at $50 per month. Any questions so far? Okay. Several, but for yeah, the sake of time, we'll have them. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, didn't we say that we just spent one hundred fifty-six thousand dollars? Is all we spent on stuff this past year on equipment and on and equipment and fleet. And you're saying that you're going to need one point two million every yes, year. Yes, ma'am. There, there's a lot of equipment and um, vehicles that need need replacement, and you'll, that'll be reflected in the budget presentation. Yeah, that's here. what I. That's what our I'm thinking. Our equipment is our workforce. Is our sure. our labor now. 
Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. 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 And this really takes the equipment replacement needs over time and allocates it, mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of being. It, it's very up and down the way we've handled say, okay. it to this point. So we're trying to build it in as a ongoing cost of the operation as opposed to a, um, you know, some years we do more, some years do we, we do mm -hmm. less. That may still be the case, but to build our cost of service around what the true cost is on an annual basis okay. as opposed to what made me end up being mm -hmm. more cyclical the way it's been done. Right, and, uh, you know, you, you look from budget year to budget year, you're, the budget requests are going to, as Eric sure. said, go up. Got all that, that real load up that you're going to do away with and do go to side loaders. Yes, ma'am. That does away with the the necessity for another person, doesn't it? You actually, right. yeah. You, sometimes two. Yep. So okay. a lot. Sometimes those split real loaders will have three people. You'll have an operator and you'll have mm -hmm. two temps. Or yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. the the idea here is to move more towards an automated. Mm -hmm. um, it's just more efficient. Yes, ma'am. And we, we actually reduce the, the potential for injuries. <coughs> there's there's a whole handful of, of I think benefits. this year, just real quickly, the day after Christmas, we picked up 40 some odd tons of blue bags in one day. Mm -hmm. And that's all manual lifting, yeah. throwing it back with trucks. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that wears on the staff. Mm -hmm. Now, now right. tell, uh, let's keep, keep rolling here because we, we've got to get through this. Yes, sir. Tonight, okay. And we yep. may bring this back again. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, again, modified operations, eliminate split reloaders, enforce ground trash, use air current burner, and automated curbside recycling. So, in digging into the automated curbside recycling, yes. um, locally, the, our processing facility um, continues to have issues with the way that we provide them our recycling materials. We put them in. We ask our customers to put them in blue bags, and they go down their processor, and they, the blue, the bags, really mess with their equipment. So they they have been urging us for quite some time to to eliminate these bags. If you look globally, the Chinese market has changed dramatically. Um, I believe it was in March of 2018, they went to a contaminated contamination standard of a half of a percent. Um, the facilities that we have in the United States have a real issue with meeting that standard. Um, so largely going to China with our recyclables, which has been done the past mm -hmm. several mm -hmm. decades, has now ceased. So there are al other alternative markets, but the shipping costs are, are really driven those costs up in recycling. Um, in terms of employee safety, we believe that going again to the more um, automated option, um, it'll improve that, that safety record um, from 2013 to 2017. There's about $265,000 worth of claims. The vast majority of that's related to manual operation. Um, one of the other benefits, of course, is consolidating use of equipment. We would use side loaders as we do with municipal solid waste with curbside recycling. Um, that gives us a bit of redundancy, um, et cetera. And then efficiencies on route. You go out there and throw, instead of sending a person out and throwing bags in, you're grabbing a cart and dumping it. So, sorry, I'm moving faster. Um, so, the other the other item is in looking at commercial collection is um, the, the annual cost. If you look at the sustainable uh, fleet options, it's about $1.4 million annually. Um, we have 624 actual customers, and that equates to 873 customer equivalents, as we discussed earlier. Um, about 55% of those customers are dumpster customers, and 45%, uh, of course, are, are the rollout customers. Uh, dumpster rates are $95 a month based on a once-a-week service, and the rollout rates are $30 a month based on a once-a-week service. So the cost of service actually puts us at about $100 per month. And when you look at that, that customer ratio of... $95 a month and $30 a month in terms of revenue, we're significantly under-recovering when it comes to commercial. One of the things that we've looked at is how do we change our commercial operation to, to make it pay for itself. And what we would have to do is significantly raise the dumpster rate is really what it boils down to, likely to a rate that customers wouldn't be able to, to really meet. Um, so one of the things we wanted to discuss with you tonight and get some input, I know we're short on time, um, and, and again, we'll be happy to come back, but look at, at our services. 
I know residential services in terms of municipal solid waste and recycling are really core services that we provide. And we work really hard to keep our customers happy. But wanted to, to broach the subject, do we want to look at eliminating dumpster service on commercial? The, the rollout service is a completely different thing. We have equipment that we can handle it, we, you know, that's a lot of the downtown area. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're providing that service well as they, they do every week. Um, but that so is. So when you say eliminate dumpster, you would mean they would have to hire. They would have to hire a private. There's a there's private. a pretty strong commercial market to handle that. Mm -hmm. uh, the rollout containers, while it's commercial, is very similar to what we do in the residential. So it's it's really not that far off from what our core business is, if you look at it that way. Um, and then we would be able to reallocate those resources into the core service. Yeah. Right. And we think it actually is a more sustainable way long term. Um, that's kind of the bottom line when you look at all this. That just, we're not recovering near what we need to. If we get to full recovery, we're probably going to start pricing ourselves out of the market anyway. Correct. And it's not our core business. And it's not a real efficient yeah. process yeah. anyway because it's one truck taking an empty dumpster, taking a full dumpster, by doing switching in and out. It's, it's just not um, a real efficient way in terms of equipment and personnel compared to what the rest of our core business is. And solid waste in large part is a, it's a volume type business. You know, exactly. we, we do not have the number of customers to sustain exactly. the amount of equipment. We have, it's about $250,000 a year in the commercial side alone um, to, to keep a sustainable fleet going, so. Why don't we just bring this back for discussion on another yeah. time so we can right. get through uh, tonight well, with, with this agenda. And, and here, whenever here. you come back next time, you can very concisely, uh, with those last mm -hmm. couple of slides, yeah. bring everybody back to the sure. table and then we can discuss it. Absolutely. You're certainly making a great case to get out of the dumpster mm -hmm. business. Yeah. So. And, and with n more on curbside for the, yeah. the residential, though. Yeah. Yes, we hear more about that yeah, because yes. okay. it's not going to be the bags. Okay. I understand. Great, right, great. Right. Right. Okay. Great work there. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Jack. City of Franklin contract 2018-0084 draft master plan for the park at Harlandsdale Farm. We have a lot of uh, people here tonight. Lisa's got lots of folks with it. <laughs> we had presented some of this at a uh, uh, um, capital investment committee a few months ago. Uh, Lisa and team working with Tuck Hinton as a consultant has refined that further and wanted to present uh, an overview of that um, draft plan to you tonight. So thank you, Gary. Take it away. Appreciate with your it. And I have, uh, of course, Tori Barnhill, the executive director of Friends of Franklin Parks, Adam Ballish, who is the president of Friends, and Dr. Monty McInturf, who's our past president. And they've been such a, um, it's been a collaborative effort as we've worked through this process along with other city departments in this plan. Um, Harlandsdale, the city has owned uh, Harlandsdale since 2005 and we had a master plan that was completed uh, shortly after that along with the conservation easement uh, two years later. But in that overall master plan it was not about being concise with the structures on the property. We knew that in the master plan you're going to restore. But as we're looking, uh, as Harlandsdale has operated and as operations have increased and the activity on the property has increased, it was important to understand from a capital standpoint, from a budgeting standpoint, planning um, of how that property would be used and what from a restoration standpoint of how we're going to um, save those facilities. And so in this master plan, we're, you have the master plan, of course, that was provided to you. It's a draft. We're looking for tonight, <coughs> not at this particular moment, but with Eric uh, or myself, if you can provide your feedback to us, if there is something within the master plan over the next couple of weeks or at least in the month of February, we'll be bringing this back to you at a BOMA, um, um, at a BOMA meeting in order for approval so that we can at least, the goal is to move forward and update the capital, the CIP project sheets that would include these projects. And then we will look at them collectively as the board and a department and then from a community standpoint with partnerships as what is those first priorities and how that will play a part. So if in, within this master plan, and I'll do the cliff um, uh, version of um, cliff note version of this plan is within it you had a plan of scope we looked at the main barn the historic Hayes home the powerhouse 
the worker houses, which is the main, what we call worker houses one and two down the main drive of Carlinsdale. Um, it, you also have on your docket is the T-Dot, uh, the bridge that's coming across the, the river. That's also included in this plan to include how those, those connections will take place on the Harlandsdale side. So that's important from connectivity. We looked at programming ideas and also the opinion of cost. Um, so each of the projects that I'll go through and we're going to uh, look at each one just quickly, they're all going to be um, presented the same way as the potential programming ideas of how the facility could be used and then also the restoration of, of, each, of the, each of the structures itself. Um, and then toward the end, I'm going to ask if friends would kind of give their view of how they would use this plan from a partnership standpoint, as you remember that we are within the existing uh, memorandum of understanding with this group with us. Uh, for the main barn, and it's what most people think about with Harlandsdale, let's talk about ho from a potential program. It's hosting miscellaneous events, weddings. Um, community meetings, tours, and even equestrian events. The main barn should stay a barn. That's what came out of this. Um, it's not a, it, yes, we may use it as an event facility, but it's a barn. And we want to be able to house horses in it for if there is a weekend event or a special event or summer camps. Those are the things we want to be able to do. But we also want to be able to do how we use it now, whether it's for maybe an art, maybe it might be a Christmas special, we might do summer camps. But it's for our community, and we host a lot of tours through that barn throughout the year, and many of you have been a part of that. So the main part is the restoration, and in the plan, it details it more, but it's about uh, restoring the main offices, the ladies' lounge, which is toward the front of the, the main barn. It's really about being able to tell that story, but then also being able to bring up from a tip technology standpoint that it's functional when you have our customers on site and they're preparing for an event. You also have in the back of the barn which was the tack room and we use it for basically for, for maintenance. If you're looking at from a warming kitchen standpoint, this is what we have at Eastern Flank. It's not a catering kitchen but a warming kitchen so that when you do host events on site there is a place for a caterer or even a private entity to be able to bring food set up and then bring that and present it out. Uh, there will be system upgrades. We're not, we're not looking to, um, to add uh, heating and air fully to the barn, but you do need to, uh, we do want those to be in the, the offices as well as the areas in your restrooms. All of that needs your, your heating and air. The main barn should have overhead heating of some sort, whether it's gas lighting or, or whatever it might be. Um, the goal is not to have it at 75 degrees, but you at least want it comfortable if you have to do something in November or December there that you can knock the chill off. Um, the barn's at three different levels right now. Basically, you have dirt, you've got concrete on the pads as you enter the, the surfaces from the main drive, and you also have the offices that sit at different levels. The goal is that this barn is not ADA accessible, that someone in a wheelchair or a child or someone with a handicap, they can access the barn, and that way we would add a flooring to the system and make it level throughout. Um, it also would be adding the lighting, the, some floor drains because of the, to be able to clean the area and also a fire sprinkler system. Now in the opinion of cost that you have in the back of the plan, it goes through a full gamut. The full price of, of looking at the main barn, which then also looking at the exterior would be part of this project, is to work through historic zoning to look at the existing siding. We redid the, the roof several years ago in a structural, but you also want to go ahead and finish the siding paint in any of the windows that we did not accomplish. So you're looking at a basically an overall total cost of about 1.7 million if you do everything. And that also includes your exterior outside with some, uh, that's part of the opinion of cost. The next, the next one, if you don't mind me just running through the slides okay. because Please. of time. The historic Hayes home, the potential programming would be, again, wedding parties, tea parties, event space, office space, commercial gallery, uh, more of from the art gallery, working with our commission. We have a lot of paintings from the existing um, artists who painted in there many years ago. Also, again, a, an office presence to be able to plug in when there's an event on site in a warming kitchen. Basically, the house needs to be restored. You have... Um, 
you have plaster walls, there's pocket doors, there's beautiful, but you need to update your mechanical plumbing. This is a full restoration project. Um, so all of the systems that would be need to bring it up to speed. But you also have the exterior as well. We've been very fortunate to be able to uh, redo the roof as well as some of the porches, but there are some siding uh, doors and windows that still need to be updated. And we've received a small grant so far, but this allows for you to look at that project. And you're looking at around 590000 for that particular structure. This is a map you've seen before that engineering had <coughs> put together that we've worked, that this is where the, um, the uh, bridge over the Harpeth, and I shared this with you, is this basically provides that connection of what we're talking about as whenever it is designated on the property of wherever the bridge would go, we've got to connect it back to the park in some way. And most likely it would be near the pond where we have ADA fishing pier, and you'd want to make those connections to the ADA fishing pier back to handicap accessible parking. And the, also the goal is to around down the inner urban that's existing there is to go ahead and pave that at least to a 12-foot swath so that then the entire facility becomes ADA accessible. Right now it's gravel and it's not ADA accessible. As many of you have walked it at pilgrimage or family day or out on your own with um, your dogs that I know some of you have. <coughs> Two of the, two of the um, other structures down the main drive are the worker houses. This is a potential program, and we were very fortunate to receive uh, from Leadership Franklin that one of the groups redid the roof several years ago and uh, was under the direction as one of the gentlemen in the room with Mr. Liggins tonight. So we were very thankful for that group to come forward. But within this, from a worker house, this is a house that still has its rooms, it still need, but it needs to be restored and brought, brought up to code. But there should be some type either of parks presence, security offices, this potential programming, maybe a potential outside user or caretaker, or if we ever were to even go back to equestrian mounted patrol, this might be a location. Um, but many uses for what this particular, over a little over a thousand square foot home could do. Uh, the worker houses too. This was several years ago. We had such um, the parks department actually gutted this particular structure. We had a lot of damage inside from water. Therefore, it's open. It's back to the studs. So this provided a different venue as far as programming for maybe a larger event space. When I say larger event, it's more of a less than 20 or 25 people in. Uh, um, a green room in this area, many of you, friends of Franklin Parks, did a great job last year at Raise the Roofs, but we had many uh, um, activity on the property where they'll actually have host a small concert in this near the, the two homes. And so you can get a couple of hundred people, but a lot of times where do you put the artist or you're waiting for a storyteller to come out? We've had that as well. So having a place to where your special guests would be, but interpretive space or meeting space but it is uh, completely open right now. So this also, would, both of these would need to be restored from your interior and your exterior, as well as working with historic zoning and planning. Um, also about the amenities of what you would need to do on the outside of these homes, whether it's providing the ADA parking um, and how you would restore it. We're looking at around 300,000 for both of these homes for restoration. Um, this is the former powerhouse, um, stands with it next to the, the main barn. And um, basically what came out of the, the master plan is before you tonight is really what came out of the original master plan when the original charrettes took place. It was about having offices. This is one of the largest spaces we have and we do believe uh, this could be a wonderful event for our community as far as a heating and cool space for meetings. Um, changing it to some type of museum to be able to tell the full story of the, the farm and having that ex, uh, to be able to be interchangeable. Wedding space, meeting space, community space, but this could be a seating of over 400 people for an event in this facility. So we, we foresee without putting a business plan together, most likely this could be a revenue model that would need to be attached with this type of facility. 
there would be a catering kitchen unlike warming kitchens because of if you're having that much space a caterer do, does need that type of room but to bring it up to code of your restrooms and all of the exterior um, you all seen the property and you know what's there right now it's a shell but it has wonderful potential but it's also a multi-level facility so Lastly is the opinion of cost uh, within the master plan itself. It provides, this is a little over $9 million, um, but it's important as we've been identifying some of these is to have an updated opinion of cost in, for not just the department and the city, but also as we begin to look at grants and partnerships, we can't do this particular property alone. Um, there's just uh, too many other projects. And so this breaks down, um, and I know it's kind of hard to see here, but it really breaks down. And when you begin to go into each of the structures, we would need to work with engineering consultant to break it down into phases. So if it looks like whatever the main bar may be, uh, we would break it down into phases. What should we do in the first phase and be able to bring that back to you? But I think for an overall master plan, um, this provides you some updated cost, um, some options for how facilities to be used, but we are looking as a, from a draft is what is your expectations for these areas. One of the things when we took it several months ago before the CIP committee and several of you were there, um, it said, you know, if you programmed every one of these all at one time, that would be an issue. And we, we believe that too. That comes down to proper planning. Um, but it's the same as we do with our other facilities is you've got to, when one program is going on, you have to understand what the others and what that would entail. And so it might be that you only have a, a certain amount of things. And those are the things that we can discuss. But that's really about programming in, in the right way and also allowing the, the property to have a respite. Um, they have to be able to recover, as we've seen with a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. um, so before, so I'm gonna end quickly because this is before you, and again, we're, we're interested in hearing, but I'd like to be able to turn it over to Adam or Dr. Uh, Monty or, or Tori, is to, um, for them to be able to share what their their vision and how they will use this plan quickly, but also what they believe is their top priority. Please. Thank you. Um, we are here to show support for Lisa and all the work she and her team have done for this um, updating of the master plan. We're very, very excited. We've been talking and planning with this with our Harlansdale committee and volunteers and our board for a long time now, and, and we just feel like this is one step closer. For thank so thank you for allowing us to come before you and, and further this conversation. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam and, and then Bonnie because there, there's some things we would love to, to talk with you further. Sure, um, thanks again for having us tonight. Um, I wanna say thank you also to some of the other people that aren't up here speaking but that were here or still are here uh, tonight to show their support. So hopefully those folks um, were, were recognized during your previous uh, uh, meeting time. But um, I, we, like Tori said, want to echo the support that we're um, behind this master plan and uh, look forward to rolling our sleeves up and working with the board on your priorities as well as uh, some of these plans that, that Lisa and her team have brought forth with the, the plans from Tuck Hinton. And um, obviously, hopefully what we have been able to accomplish in the past is somewhat of a precursor to some of these things um, coming on down the line and the fact that we were able to, to build a one and a half million dollar um, arena and facility there with obviously your all's help and contribution, but the, the vast majority of those dollars raised privately through the public-private partnership. <coughs> um, we believe we've got some successful models that can uh, help take this park and further it in accordance with these plans and, and hopefully that is uh, in, in showing of your all's support. But, uh, one of the things that we wanted to announce tonight as, as part of this effort um, is that the board is very excited from Friends of Franklin Parks Board perspective uh, to be able to announce a, an initial pledge of $300,000 towards these facilities and primarily the barn that we would be ready to, to move forward with immediately and would love the opportunity to work with Lisa uh, legal and the rest of your staff to figure out how that best is accommodated within your all's goals and, and thoughts of the master plan. And um, 
and really the legal mechanisms at which you can receive a grant or, or funds and apply them to a specific project. Um, as Tori mentioned, we've, we've got kind of this um, organizational group um, that is the Harlansdale Committee that Monty chairs, and, and he could tell you a little bit more about what they've been doing and, and that overall um, um, setup and goals. Well, thank you so much, Adam. It's with, with great excitement that I get to speak to you guys tonight. You, you guys are the leaders of our town. Our mayor's here. It, it's, it's with great honor that I, that I speak to you, but I'm not speaking on my behalf. I'm speaking on behalf of the people uh, of, of Franklin. And those people are right back here. These are, these are people that, that meet on a monthly basis and, and talk on a daily basis. And, and we really care about Harlansdale. We realize you guys have got a tremendous amount on your plate. This, this presentation shows that, hey, we got a lot of work to do. We, we want you to see us as true friends and people that can bring opportunity to this town as members of this town to make these things happen, not later, but now. It, it, if, we, if the town has to bear this burden on its own, it's a great burden, but it's a great work, and we're here to help with that work. And it's very simple. Well, we got moms back here, dads, granddads, grandmoms. We've got a young man I'd like to recognize. Andrew, if you'd stand up. Andrew is the son of one of our, 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 our committee members. He's a freshman at Franklin High School. This kid loves parks. He loves horses. He loves history. And it's right here, right down the street, that actually, and we all know this, is a potential fire hazard right now. And we need to preserve it. What is our motivation? It's simple. This, these children, this town, deserves this iconic barn, actually the most historic barn in the state of Tennessee, I would argue, that's on the historic preservation list, the, one of the most iconic pieces of our town. It needs help. Now, I'm showing some passion, and my motivation is simple. We want to help, and we don't want to help later. We want to help now. So a $300,000 pledge says, let's roll up our sleeves together and make this happen. We're not trying to increase the priorities of, of the work of this town. We're trying to simply say, let's, let's help make something happen great. And let's do it together. And let's take this and roll it into the next project and the next project. So the Harlandsdale campus is the most prestigious part in the state of Tennessee. It could easily happen if we would stop thinking about it and just simply do it. So I, I hope that I hope you will see the wisdom and see the thought and see the opportunity and, and don't get down into the detail as we'll figure that out as we go and simply say, this feels good and let's make it happen for Andrew. Please. We love you, Monty. <laughs> <laughs> we, we love your passion too. Passion is good. Again, Mayor, if, if board members, and thank you for, for you all in, in, in speaking toward this master plan. If there is something, uh, this might be the first time that some of you have heard about the master plan. I know that we presented to CIP. We'd like to know your feedback, um, and then we can incorporate that into the final document prior to approval. Thank Great you, presentation, thank you. and thanks for raising that money, and we look forward to being able to accept it. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Okay, uh, next is uh, Ordinance 2018-32, an ordinance to amend Title 16, uh, blah, 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 relative to use of <laughs> city police officers. So essentially our code now requires the use of Franklin police officers for traffic control when work is going on in the right-of-way. We want to modify uh, our ordinance to allow for non-Franklin police officers to do it, but this provides specific guidance and how that is accomplished. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds Thank good. good. Number nine good job, is uh, <laughs> interlocal agreement with Williamson County for Fire Station 7. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that one? Appreciate it. Yes, okay. Number 10 is a presentation and discussion of recommended changes to neighborhood meetings required as part of the planning and review process. Uh, how long is this one going to take? Let's jump to the meat of it. This is a follow-on to something we talked about yeah. in the fall. We did some addition, additional thinking about how we might better structure neighborhood meetings, and so this is a result of some of that uh, and, review. And so. uh, by the way, we're going to defer item 11 to February the 12th, yes. 2019. Okay, meat of the matter. 
in there. Eventually we'll get the PowerPoint pulled up, but essentially we want to propose an hour-long meeting for neighborhood meetings. The first 10 to 15 minutes, we would like to still do a open house format, a very informal setting where people could walk up, look at a plan on a table, talk one-on-one -on -one to the applicant to understand a little bit about the project. Um, the goal of that is just for the folks that don't need to listen to the whole presentation, have specific questions that want to ask, or just want to do a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time. But keep it to 10 to 15 minutes. Then we would do a 15-minute presentation by the applicant where they could talk about the project. And then the rest of the meeting, 30 to 35 minutes, would be a Q&A time. Um, perfect. Okay. So that's what we're thinking through. Um, we heard what you had to say about have people come up to the podium and have their questions at the podium and then have people line up. We actually implemented that in a citizen meeting in January, early, or yeah. December, and it did work very well. So I think it would resolve the idea that everyone hears the same questions, everyone hears the same answers, and they're informed with it. Um, and we do want to have a timeline where it is done at an hour, so we get the ideas out there, but it doesn't drag on forever and ever. Um, some of the things we also suggested were, if you go back just one more, um, put a slide in there about where the neighborhood meeting is in the process so people understand that. Um, perhaps read the civility code statement just so people are aware of there's a proper protocol here to have a certain level of respect for everyone. But that is the gist of it. <laughs> okay. The only thing I saw was sure. at the end, whenever you have the letter, you don't say anything about the 30 minutes at the end. At least I missed it if it was that. You're right. No, I did not update this letter from the October presentation. We wanted to find out your feedback before we change Yeah, I, I think it sounds, sounds but good. But I think but we should put, like, just that timeline yeah. within the yeah. letter so they know. That sounds good. Okay, thank you for doing this. Sure. Uh, it's long overdue. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I love the podium thing because okay. I think that worked very well down here and uh, yeah. keeps people from shouting out, keeps mm -hmm. them in order, and and some people don't get, they have one person had their hand up forever in a meeting and never got right. called on, and we sort of had to point them out, and so that at least we don't bypass people. The only other thing is um, what I really liked there and that I'd like to have implemented is that when the... Uh, uh, applicant does their presentation you give them a table and if it's appropriate microphones yes. it just gives a better air of professionalism mm -hmm. and keeps that uh, more in order and that worked very well it did. and I think if you put them a tip rather than standing up walking around the room then people have a tendency to shout out if you have it it's just more professional that's a good point okay yes. good point. So, uh, and also, I think you mentioned putting these all on the calendar, on the city calendar. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, city calendar. Okay, we'll be uh, back in here as fast as we can get things changed over. <laughs> Thank you so much.